what a joy it is to be here. And I haven't been back in South Africa in three years. Uh, I was on the plane the other day and somebody asked me, they said, have you been before? And I said, well, I quit counting at 50 trips. Did you hear what I just said to you? I quit counting at 50 trips. Do you know, right, how many time, how much money I've spent on plane tickets, right? It's staggering. So I, I talked to a man, he's from South Africa, and I said, shouldn't I get an honorary citizenship or something, a passport, something for that many trips? So anyway, it's good to be here, and I'm so excited to be here at Redemption Church. Uh, you know, I'm so proud of your pastors and everything they've done and the incredible work and what you all are doing, supporting them, and the, the difference you're making. And uh, so it's, I'm, I'm truly humbled. Thank you for letting us be here. It's a, it's a great honor. All right, you guys ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I honor you and thank you today for every person that's here. I thank you for what, you're going, what you are doing in them and maybe just as important, Lord, what you're doing through them. And now we ask you in the next few moments to speak to us today. We've come to church today to worship you. We've come to church today to honor. We've come to church to give. We've come to church to serve. We've come to church to be encouraged. We've come to church to encourage others. But we mostly have come, Lord, for you to speak to us. Take one hand, put it on your heart, and say, Lord, speak to me today. Speak to me. Speak to me. I want to learn from you. Speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Look, I'm going to be taking you to a, a portion of Scripture today, and uh, it's, the, the more I look at it and the more I think about it, the more I've just come to really appreciate in the last couple of months that I think this story that we're going to read here in just a moment is probably one of the least understood and at the same time one of the most misunderstood portions of Scripture in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to just give you a little bit of thought, all right, just something to think about. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't, and if you have, maybe you may have forgotten it. But just to add this to you, right, you, when, when, when you read your Bible, you've got to read it in the light of itself. Can I hear a good amen on that, right? We don't read it in the light of our experience. We don't read it in the light of other people's experience, Right? I don't believe in healing because I have been healed. I believe in healing because the Bible says Jesus bore my sicknesses, carried my diseases, by his stripes I'm healed. Right? So we read the Bible in the light of itself. Amen? I said amen? amen. All right. And then the other thing we, we need to do is we need to, by that I mean, we read the Bible in the light of itself, is that the Bible does not contradict each other. And particularly an author like the Apostle Paul. All right, there is a consistency to his writing. And this portion of scripture, okay, it's going to make sense to you in a moment when I take you to it. So Paul's writing, and he writes things like Romans, the eighth chapter, right? We are more than conquerors through him who loves us, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. If God be for us, who can be against us, right? That great chapter, Romans chapter 8. And then he writes other things like, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, right? My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, right? I mean, well, I could just go on for the rest of the service quoting great statements the Apostle Paul made. Now, please, let's go back to the first one I started with, right? Where he said in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Okay, so we are what? More than conquerors through him who loves us. And then we come to this story in the Bible, and it's like, for some reason, Bible teachers suddenly think Paul goes off into weird world, all right, and he loses his whole sense of consistency, and then we hear this crazy doctrine. All right, so are you ready to read? Okay, what I'm going to read to you. All right, I may have overhyped it a little bit. I hope not, okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, all right, beginning in verse 1, Paul said, it's not expedient for me doubtless to glory. All right, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He said, I knew a man in Christ 
about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows, such as one was caught up into the third heaven. Now, you know the third heaven is the heaven where God lives, right? Okay? Now, this man that he's talking about was him. Okay? And so he continues, and I knew such a man. I hope you knew yourself, Paul. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how he was caught up into paradise. Now watch this. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So in other words, he heard things in heaven that he was then told when you go back to the earth, you can't tell people what you heard. I've always find that kind of strange, to be honest with you. All right. So here we go. He said, of such an one will I glory, yet not in myself I will not glory. Now watch this, but in mine infirmities. So Paul said this amazing statement. He said, when, when there is our, the, what he called infirmities in my life, I will glory. Now from that, People have interpreted that because we use the word infirmities in our world today to describe sickness and disease. But Paul didn't use that word that way. All you got to do, okay, I've done it for you. Say thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Is get out an English New Testament dictionary and you can look these words up. And what you discover there is that the word infirmities means, now watch this, Paul said, when I have it bad. When I have it bad. And if you read the life of the Apostle Paul, there were times when he had it bad. All right, when he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was whipped, he was robbed, he was deceived, he was run out of town. Could somebody say amen to all that, right? And that was like a good day in Paul's life. All right? And so when I began studying this and looking at this, I said, you know what? I associate with that. Because there have been times in my life, to be very frank with you, I had it bad. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? It wasn't all, woohoo, glory to God, this is wonderful, hot fudge with ice cream. No, it was crummy. It was bad. Right? Things going on in my world. Right? So I want to know, how did, you re how did Paul respond to that? Okay, now let me remind you today. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you become a child of God. When you become a child of God, Colossians chapter 1 says you are moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And now you live in that kingdom. Now think with me for a moment, all right? There are rules that govern the kingdom of God. It is a real kingdom run by God the Father, God the Son, and God, and God the Holy Spirit. It is, a, it is a, a royal dictatorship. Okay, I use that word hesitancy because let me say, it's probably not this way in South Africa, but in America, we think the kingdom of God is run by our opinions. That somehow, well, I know the Bible says that, but I think. Okay, let me help you in your walk with God. Are you ready? I'm going to say this to you as sweet as I can. It's going to really help you. Are you ready? God doesn't care what you think. I know, that's hard on you. You should see how that goes over in the States. Because every American now is convinced that their opinion is the supreme opinion that the universe has ever heard, and you must agree with me. And then I come along and tell them, God doesn't care what you think. He's not going to conform his kingdom to fit you. You are going to conform to fit his kingdom. All right? Now that means the way you think, the way you act, the way you react, what you believe how you speak, the way you respond. Can somebody say amen to all that, right? So now we're looking here about kingdom principle. If anybody knew about how to live in the kingdom, it was the apostle Paul. So he said, I will rather glory when I have it bad. He said, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. 
But now forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be or that which he hears of me. It's an incredible statement. Paul said, you think of me, and truthfully, it's the way everyone sees everyone, right? But Paul says, I am what I am, and you know what I am by, look at it, look at what he says again, by how you see me and what you hear of me. So you know me by the way I live. Right? Now that almost sounds too simple. Okay? But I, I, I you know, Pastor Joshua said, I pastor a church in El Paso. He's been there 45 years, pastoring the same church. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have this saying at my church, if you're, if you're in here and you're single and you're, a young lady, and you're dating a guy, and he tells you he loves you, but he treats you bad, step away from the curb, let that bus go by, and come get on another bus. All right? Because they are how they act. Now, that just saved you years of therapy. Right there. Okay? No, Jesus said you know people by their fruit. You know, don't, don't come over here telling me you're an apple when I can plainly see you're an orange. I was born at night, but does not last night. Okay? So he comes along. He keeps writing, right? He said, at least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, here's where people get weird. A thorn in the flesh... Now, I've heard that said that Paul had weak knees, that he could hardly walk, and yet he walked over two-thirds of the known earth three times in his ministry. I've heard another guy say that he had this condition. They even give you the medical name where when he would start preaching, pus would drip out of his eyes and run down his cheeks, and yet people would sit in the room with him watching him preach all night long. Stop it. All right? If anyone should know what the thorn was, it should be him. I said, if anyone should know what the thorn was, it should be him. Amen. It was him that it was happening to. Yes. And him said, it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. The word messenger, every other place in the New Testament is translated spirit or angel. So what he said was, when I began to get all of this revelation that was coming to me, to bring to the church world, he said, Satan sent his spirit against me, an assignment against me, and he was like a thorn in my side. And all you have to do is read the book of Acts, and you would see Paul would come into a town, right? He would be having revival, and then suddenly the spirit would show up, and the people would turn against him. And the next thing you knew, Paul was beat up, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was robbed, he was run out of town, he was put into prison. Okay, why? Because the devil did not want what Paul knew to get any higher and have any more impact so he would fight against him. It's shocking to me how often I meet people that are surprised when the devil opposes them. None of you, all those people come to the next service, right? All right. He said, at least I should be exalted above measure or... I should have even greater influence. How's that? Now, I've heard people say, well, but Pastor, you know, uh, uh, I think, you know, here we go, I think that, that God knew, here's another one I've heard, that God knew Paul had a problem with his ego, so when he gave him this revelation, he didn't want Paul's ego to get too big so he would keep him down by giving him these uh, things like that. Now, really, my family, wouldn't the simplest thing, if you are God and you know Paul has an ego problem, and if you gave him this revelation, it would blow his ego out of thing. So wouldn't the simplest thing to do is just not give him the revelation? (laughs) 
You know, when I was 17, I got really twisted out with my dad. And the reason why I got twisted out with him was because when I was 17, he would not buy me a new Corvette. The reason why he would not buy me a new Corvette is because he said, if I buy you a new Corvette, I will have to come pick you up after you wrapped it around a telephone pole somewhere. And he was right. Now I'm 72 and I still have not had a new Corvette because my heavenly father must know that I'm still not mature enough to have a Corvette. (laughs) Am I missing something here? I don't think I am. Now here's where I want you to see this. Are you with me so far? So you see what's going on, right? So Paul writes, and it all begins with that statement in verse 8, I will not glory but in my infirmities. So when I have it bad, I move in this direction. Did you see that? I glory when I have it bad. Now you're going to understand that now. Here we go. For this thing I sought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, my grace is sufficient unto you. Now, it is amazing to me how that has been so misunderstood, all right? Now, I know you all know what grace means, but let me remind you today, right? Grace in the Bible has basically two definitions. Number one, it's God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. So it's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor with God and from God into your life. Do we agree on that? All right, so it's this favor with God. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. Charles Neiman translation, grace means you don't get what you deserve. You get what the Father wants you to have. Beautiful. All right, but there's a second definition of favor, and it means the endowment of power. So grace is not this sweet little doctrine that we put over here on the side. Isn't that great? Oh, grace is so wonderful. It's so beautiful. It's like little lambs walking through the fields. Oh, grace. No, grace is also an endowment of power. It brings power to your life. All right? It empowers us to live the Christian life. Can I get a better amen than I just got, right? So he said, my grace is sufficient. Now, if you take notes, and if you don't take notes, you're going to start today because you need to write this down. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Listen, what I'm going to share with you in the next 20 minutes has the potential to change your life. To change your life, that you can walk out of here today and take what I'm teaching you and put it in application in your life before you get to your car. It's incredible that we learn from the life of the Apostle Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, most people that I've discovered, and I did it too, we just kind of glaze over this verse. And we just go over it and we say, well, God told Paul, learn to live with it. Someday it'll be worth it all, by and by. Pie in the sky. Someday, my grace is sufficient. For you. Oh, poor Paul. Poor Paul. But remember, this is the same man that wrote, We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. This is the same man that wrote, I can do all things through Christ. This is the same man that wrote, If God be for me, who can be against me? It's the same man that wrote, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's the same man. He hadn't forgotten it. The God that told him those things has not forgotten what he told Paul. It's the same truth, the same revelation. And now he says, my grace is sufficient for you. So write this down. The word sufficient means my grace is strong and able to bring assistance to your life. My grace is strong and able to assist you in your life. My grace is strong. What is it? It's strong and able. I like that. I like it. I like it. See, something can be strong, but what good is it doing me? He said it is strong and able 
to assist you in your life. Now he breaks forth, and watch what he says. For my strength is made perfect or complete or really seen in weakness. Now think with me for a moment. What's he saying here? What is he saying to you and me as we live in this world, this, this, this crazy world that we live in? As we live in this world that at times makes no sense, this crazy world where bad things sometimes happen to really good people. Can I hear an amen on that? Hmm? What he's saying is, is that when weakness comes up, let me tell you what the word weakness means. The word weakness there means when I am oppressed or I am distressed. When I am oppressed or when I am distressed. So what he's saying there is, is that God's strength reacts to weakness like a vacuum. So weakness is like a vacuum and that strength moves towards it and against it. Okay? He's not saying, I'll give you strength to get through it. No, he said, I'm giving you strength to overcome it. Paul forgot that for a moment. So God reminds him of it here in Corinthians. All right? So then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities or when I have it bad. So he's telling you how he reacts, what he learned, what he wants us to learn, how I am to react when I have it bad. I am to react from the standpoint of I am being, there is grace, there is strength, grace is strong and able to assist me. Can somebody shout hallelujah over this, right? I mean, this is amazing to me. He said, I will rather glory in my infirmities. Why? that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then he continues, therefore, look at all these therefores. You know, there was a great Bible teacher years ago. He's in heaven now. His name was Kenneth Hagin. And, and Dr. Hagin used to say, when you read your Bible and you see the word therefore, see what it's there for because it's there for a reason. Hard to argue with that wisdom. All right. So the word therefore literally means because of this. He said because of this. Because of what? Because God's strength moves into the vacuum called weakness. Because if I recognize that and I believe that, that God's grace is here strong and able to assist me, right? Then that grace, that power is going to move into that vacuum called weakness. When I have it bad, strength is going to come into that. Come on. Right? He said, therefore, I will take pleasure when I have it bad. Now, or infirmities. Now, I, he's going to give you some other names here of some other situations. I think, that's just the way I, I kind of read this that this describes some of the bad things that happens in life. All right? And he says, in reproaches, are you taking notes? The word reproaches means when I'm treated shamefully. And Paul was treated shamefully. People criticized him. They mocked him. They attacked him. In 1 Corinthians 11, he said, my own brethren betrayed me. People close to me took advantage of me. He said, I, I was treated shamefully. You know, there were times in El Paso now, if you came to us and there in our church, and, you know, we, we've, we've taken on this position in our community now, and, uh, you know, everybody wants to be our friends, you know, all the politicians, all the other pastors in town want to be my friend. They, whenever they see me, they come up, oh, Pastor Neva, you know, and I just stand there and look at them and think, you didn't treat me that way 30 years ago. <laughs> 30 years ago, you were on the radio calling me a heretic. Hmm? 
30 years ago, you treated me shamefully. Now, I'm not saying that, but I'm thinking it. <laughs> I smile and take a picture. <laughs> and in my heart, what I really want to do is put my arm around them and when the picture's done, <clears throat> How's that? I bet that hurt, didn't it? Yeah, remember that next time you go on the radio. But I don't. Be proud of me. Amen. All right? So when I'm treated shamefully, he said in necessities. The word necessities means when I meet opposing forces. Right? I'm sure that's happened to every one of you in this room. You've met opposition in this walk that you've committed to with God. You've met opposition. Can I hear amen to that, right? You've met opposition. And guess what? You're going to meet some more. There's a thief in the earth that comes. Jesus said he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God has given you grace that is strong to assist you. All right? Watch, he continues. Are you learning anything? In necessities, right? In necessities, when you're being opposed. In persecution. The word persecution means you are followed with acts of hatred. You're followed with acts of hatred. You know, there were people over the years that I knew, family, guys I went to school with, and we were buddies and we were, everything was great until I went down this path, this path that I'm on now. Then I went down this path and suddenly we quit getting invited to the family reunions. We, could be get, we quit getting asked to birthday parties. Uh, we quit being told about Christmas parties. You know, uh, people that, that we thought were our friends started being mean to us. What is that? That's persecution. And you know what? It hurts. And you know something else? It's supposed to. <laughs> That's why Satan does it. You can go home today and read Mark the fourth chapter. And in Mark the fourth chapter, Jesus said that persecution and affliction comes into your life to separate you from the word of God, to try to get you to throw in the towel, try to get you to quit. Try to get you to walk away from church. Try to get you to trying to get you to quit serving God. Trying to get quit get you to quit building your house on the rock, which is the greatest defense you can have when the storms of life come. He continues in persecutions, in distresses. Now write this one down because this one is really manifesting in our world today. The word distress means anxiety or discomfort within you. Anxiety or discomfort that comes from within. It's not outside, it's inside. Does anybody know what I'm talking about right now, right? Anxiety or discomfort from within. Now, Paul said, when I face this, when this comes against me, all right, so here we go. I'm going to kick it into turbocharge now. All right, so what is Paul saying to us here? Okay. What is he saying to us? Again, now, we tie all scripture to all scripture. Can I hear a good amen? Yeah. So we read other scripture. Is there other scripture that backs up this? You know what Paul is telling you to do? You know what Paul's telling me to do? When I face a problem, I need to meet the problem with the promise. Did you hear that? I need to meet the problem with the promise. I need to meet the problem with the the promise. I need to meet the problem with the promise. If I'm going to live in the kingdom of God and experience God's strength in my life, I need to meet the problem with 
the promise, okay? So let me give you another verse that backs this up 100%. You know it. I'm going to quote it to you. In Mark, the 11th chapter, Jesus said, have the God kind of faith in verse 22. You ever heard that verse? Have the God kind of faith. But the first thing we need to know is, what is faith? It's amazing to me how many Christian people I meet around the world that are doing their best to live by faith, walk by faith, and I ask them, what is faith? And they can't tell me what faith is. Or they'll quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No, that verse does not tell you what faith is. That faith tells you what faith does. But I need to know if I'm going to live by it, if I'm going to walk by it, if I'm going to receive by it, if, I, if it is my shield that quenches the fiery darts of the wicked, I got to know what faith is. Okay, so what is faith? Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not a feeling, although it'll give you a feeling. It's not an emotion, though it'll affect your emotions. It's not an attitude, but it'll sure enough give you an attitude. So what is it? Well, the answer is found. You can go and look it up in 2 Corinthians 4.13. Paul writing once again, and he's, are you learning anything today? Paul writing once again, and says, but we having received the same spirit of faith as it is written, God speaking of himself, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. So faith... Faith is made up of two components, believing and speaking, yeah. believing and speaking, believing and speaking. So here it is, pop test. What is faith? Believing, believing and speaking. Now we all know what speaking is. What is believing? Believing is a choice. You have been choosing to believe or not to believe all your life. You chose to believe your parents or not believe your parents. You chose to believe that teacher or you not believe that teacher. You chose to believe that young man that told you he loved you or you chose not to believe him. So what is God asking you to do? He's asking you to choose to believe what he has said about your life. That's all he's asking you to do. Choose to believe what he has said about your life. Now get ready, get ready. You need to get this. But faith isn't only believing. He said we believe and therefore we speak. We believe and therefore we speak. So in other words, in God's kingdom that I'm now living in, my speaking is driven by my believing. So I believe and therefore speak. So I choose to believe what God has said. And because I believe what God has said, then I'm going to say what I believe. And I believe what God has said. So I'm going to say about my life what God has said about my life. Therefore, watch this. It's going to open up to you. Therefore, we live by believing and speaking. Above all, taking the shield of believing and speaking. So now, believing and speaking is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our believing and speaking. So Jesus said, have the God kind of believing and speaking. For, for verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever shall say, whoa, Unto this mountain, what is a mountain? A mountain is anything standing between you and the fulfillment of God's promise in your life or a problem. A have it badly. Amen? So he said to speak to the mountain. And what do you tell the mountain? Be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. Charles Lehman translation, you got to get on up out of here. You gotta get on up out of here. He didn't say learn to live with the mountain. 
He didn't say, ask God to give you the patience to live with it. No, he said, speak to it and tell it to get out of your life. So you respond, watch, you respond to the mountain with the promise. You respond to the problem with the promise. You respond to the problem with the promise. Am I getting through to you, right? And then he goes on to say, so speaking on this mountain to say, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, get ready, and shall not doubt in his heart. Write this down. The word doubt there, three words for doubt in the New Testament. This one means shall not withdraw. So when you speak to the mountain, keep speaking to the mountain. Keep speaking to the mountain. Don't speak to it and then pull back from it. No, once you speak to it, keep speaking to it, keep speaking to it, keep speaking to it, keep speaking to it. But remember, you are speaking what you are believing. What am I believing? I'm believing the promise and I'm applying the promise to the mountain. That's good teaching, Charles. Amen. I have to agree with you. That's outstanding. All right. Now watch this. We're almost done. He said, or distresses. So when I'm anxious, when I'm distressed. Nowhere in the Bible does it say learn to live with it. I said, no, there's strength coming to you. There is ability coming to you to bring assistance to your life. But I have to apply it. I have to believe it. I can't keep talking about the problem. I need to respond to the problem with the promise. Now, here it comes. This is the best part. Watch. For when I am weak. Hmm? For when I am weak, when I'm oppressed, when I'm distressed, when I'm encountering all these things and a few others, Paul said, I've learned something now. When that weakness comes, when I have it bad, when stuff begins to happen to me, now I'm going to respond according to what, how God told me. He said, for when I am weak, he didn't say, I'm not praying for God to give me, you know, get me through it. No, he said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Now write this down. The word strong there has three word definition. Are you ready? It literally means, Paul said, for when I am weak, I am strong, I am able, and I can. I am strong, I am able, and I can. I am strong, I am able, and I can. I am strong. I am able and I can. I am strong. I am able and I can. I am strong. I am able and I can. So what did you say? So when this weakness comes, I respond with the promise. And the promise is God's grace is strong and able to assist me. So I, when the way I respond to this, to this persecution, to this affliction, to this infirmities, to these bad times, I respond to them and say, I know you're there, but I'm declaring to you that because of God's grace, because of what Christ has done for me, because I am a child of God, because greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world, because I now have a blood covenant with the almighty God through his son. Christ, my Passover, has been slain for me. So I respond to this weakness by telling you, I'm not weak. I'm telling you that I'm strong, I am able, and I can. I did not lose my ability. I did not lose that I can do all things through Christ. This is in total harmony with everything the Apostle Paul taught. And he wrote Timothy later in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and said, you remember all that stuff I went in? God delivered me from all of it. Amen. All of it. He delivered me from all of it. And my family wants to deliver you too. And he's given you the grace to make it happen. Stand to your feet with me. He's given you the grace. Can I pray for you today? Amen. Did you learn anything? Was it worth coming to church for today? Amen. Lift your hands. Lift your hands towards heaven. 
Now, maybe you're here today, and maybe you've got some of these issues in your life. Maybe you're full of anxiety. Maybe you have a hard time sleeping at night. Maybe there's something going on in your life right now, and you say, Pastor, to be honest with you, my life really kind of stinks right now. Okay, welcome to have it bad. I'm not making light of it. It's not fun. Listen, I've had bad times. I've had good times. Good times are gooder. Bad times are no fun. But thank God I'm not in the bad times by myself. I'm in the bad times with strength. I said I'm in the bad times with strength. So are you. Lift your hands towards heaven. Shout it out loud with me. I am strong. strong. Come on now. Say it like you mean it. Let's try it again. Ready? I am strong. I am able. And I can. Because the power of Christ rests upon me. I am strong. I am able. And I can. From now on, I'm going to meet the problem with the promise. With the promise. I'm going to speak to the mountain. And I'm not going to back away. I'm here to overcome. And through him I will. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can I have, yeah, give the Lord a great hand clap today. Beautiful. Could I have every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment? Pastor Joshua is coming in just a second. But I want to give you the opportunity today. I've talked to you several times during the time we've had today about living as a child of God. But then the question is, how do you become a child of God? You know, the first time I heard that back when I was in college, somebody said that to me, you can be a child of God. You know what my reaction was? Well, I can't imagine how hard that's got to be. I mean, really, to get something that great? Come on. To be called a child of God, that's got to be hard. I mean, I didn't see that as anything easy. That had to be difficult. There had to be mountains I had to climb, tasks I had to perform had to be to get something that great and then i discovered and i want to tell you today no it's not hard for you it's easy it was hard to make it easy but it's easy for you romans 10 therefore if any man confess jesus as lord and believe in his heart god is raising from the dead he shall be saved It's got to be harder than that, right? So all I have to do is believe and speak. And I can become a child of God. God will forgive me of my sins. Yeah. But you have to recognize your need to have a Lord in your life. Every human needs a Lord. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. I need one. You need one. You want me to tell you why? Because all of us have the capacity to do some really not nice stuff. And I need to live my life with the Lord in my life. And so do you. We need a Savior. So I want to give you that opportunity today before we close. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've never received him into your life, you've never accepted him as your Savior, today is your day. This is your moment to become a child of God. I can't explain any more to you. There's a lot more pastor's going to come and share with you. But if I could just have every head bowed and every eye closed just a moment. If you've never prayed and asked Jesus, Lord, we're all going to pray together and we're going to ask you just to pray along with us. And Jesus is going to come into your life. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no maybes. He's going to come into your life. Are you ready? Everyone say with me, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe you died rose again for me for this moment that I could receive you into my life as my Lord and Savior I need you to sit on the throne of my heart and teach me how to live I receive you now into my life in Jesus name Amen Congratulations if you prayed that prayer I've got to run. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Hope to see you again. See you later. Thank you, Pastor Charles, for that incredible word today in season.
Um, I want to say to those of you who prayed that prayer for the very first time today, you are what the Bible calls a new believer. You are a child of God. And those of you who prayed that prayer for the very first time today, we don't want you leaving without telling us because we want to give you gifts. We want to pray with you. We want to bless you in this new faith that you have today. So once we dismiss the service, there's a whole table out there called New Believers. We want to bless you with the gift. Please tell us. We want to celebrate with you. And we want to speak to you about this incredible decision of what it is to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Those of you watching online, all the information is up on the screen right now, how you can tell us. We want to send you gifts. We want to be able to bless you, send you resource. So just tell us, respond to the email, or just wherever you're watching, even on social media, you can say, I just prayed that prayer. Let our team know so that we can reach out to you and celebrate with you today. Were you blessed by that word today, church? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's so good. It's such a word in season. There's so much, uh, you know, God is speaking into our next season. And I'm preparing for 2023. And um, just listening to what the Lord is, is saying. And it's amazing how He's building this word for next year. And the thing is, we can say categorically, right? We're going to face resistance. The earth is a mess. Problems come. Persecution comes. But what's incredible is that that is met by the promise of God. And, and I am so excited at how God is speaking over the church, the promises that He has for our lives. And that's what we hold to, and that's what I'm excited to see unfold. We're going to receive communion together right now. If you can, if you're watching at home, you can push pause and get your communion elements. If you're in the building, grab your little communion elements. If you don't have, raise your hand up high. Our dream team would love to get some communion elements to you. You just bend this little lip up and down, and uh, you kind of hear it snap, and that helps you open it up easier. If you can, take out your wafer, your bread at home. Jesus' body suffered so greatly he was tortured unto death and that torture was for a purpose it was for the sickness the attack on our health the attack on our homes on our minds all that comes with this fleshly aging body all that comes against you all that comes against us and so we take this bread today and we bless it because it is the body of Christ broken for us. And we declare that as it is broken for us and we partake, we receive healing unto our bodies. So today as you take the bread and break it, eat healing in Jesus' name. We receive and declare healing and wholeness. We speak to the mountain of sickness. We believe Jesus was tortured for us, but we believe that gives us His divine healing today. If you can, open up to the juice. The Bible speaks over the blood of Jesus shed for us. This cleanses us of all unrighteousness. This declares us worthy of God's grace and favor. And this is the ultimate promise of God, that we are righteous, perfect, pleasing children of God. You know, for some of us, we don't face sickness, but we face a thinking of condemnation and shame that says we don't deserve, we aren't worthy, we haven't done enough, we haven't worked enough. Why would God protect us? Why would God take care of us? Well, the blood of Jesus declares that you were so valuable to the heart of God that He sent His Son to die for you. And through that death, He would have a relationship based on His love for you. He gets to do for you what you could never do for yourself because of who you are through this covenant, through this death. So today, as we take the blood of Jesus... 
We believe and we speak that we are righteous, perfect, pleasing children of God, cherished and loved. We believe our best is yet to come. And we receive that as we drink that. Father, we declare all who receive of communion today, receive all of the riches of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching today's word. I know you were blessed greatly and I wanna let you know if you want more resource like this, more sermons like this, they're all available for free on YouTube or on our Redemption Church app. So I wanna encourage you, if it blessed you, share this link with someone else and ensure that you get more of God's goodness and word in you. We are so excited that Redemption Church has been able to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today and look forward to seeing you return for more of God's goodness as we preach the word of Jesus. Be blessed.